this is going to go. <clears throat> thank you. Um, on behalf of the National Child Passenger Safety Board, thank you for joining us for what, what do techs need to know about autonomous and electric vehicles. This webinar will review child passenger safety considerations related to autonomous and electric vehicles. We're going to share research findings, and it will follow by a discuss or with a discussion about why the information is important and how technicians can or should use this information curbside. Today's speakers include Jalaj Maheshwari with the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and Denise Donaldson with Safe Ride News. Sorry, one second, technical difficulties. I'm Amy Artuso, Senior Program Manager with the National Safety Council, and I'm honored to serve as the moderator for this webinar, along with Mandy C. Toller um, in Alaska, who's also going to be assisting. So thank you, Mandy. And we have planned time to answer questions at the end of the presentation, so please enter your questions in the Q&A box throughout the presentation. And we look forward to that discussion at the end. As a reminder, attendees are requested to not participate in this webinar if you are operating a motor vehicle. This webinar is being recorded and you can listen to the recording when you safely arrive at your destination. The recording will be posted to carseyeducation.org within one to two business days. And for the child passenger safety technicians in attendance, the presentation qualifies for one continuing education unit or CEU and attendance on this webinar is required for at least 45 minutes to earn the CEU credit. Proof of attendance will be emailed 24 hours after the webinar. And so with that, let's begin our first presentation. As I mentioned, we have two presenters today, Jalaj Maheshwari and Denise Donaldson. I will introduce each presenter before their respective presentation. So I'm going to stop sharing so that Jalaj can share his slides. And Jalaj, Jalaj sorry, is a research associate at the Center of Injury Research and Prevention at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He has extensive experience working in the automotive safety space, dealing with research questions centered on automobile crashes, occupant safety and protection, injury analysis, injury prevention and mitigation, crash worthiness, and human machine interaction. His research interests are in applications of computational modeling, biomechanics, artificial intelligence, autonomous systems, and robotics for safe autonomy. Please join me in welcoming Jalaj. Hey everyone, uh, and just to confirm, you can see my screen absolutely perfectly. Yes, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Amy. Uh, so today under the broader topic of what do techs need to know about AVs, I'll be talking about translating consumer preferences and perceptions on automated systems and vehicles to occupant safety. Now, development into autonomous vehicles is being conducted in stages with each stage resulting in increased level of automation and a decrease in the amount of driver input required. Now, this particular infograph that you see in front of you is the most commonly one used that describes those different levels of automation. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with this image, it describes the five levels of automation as defined by SAE. Now, most vehicles that you see on the road today are level zero where there is no automation, level one where there are some driving assistant features included in the vehicle, and level two where the vehicle has some navigational features, but the driver must still be engaged in the driving task. An example of level two is Tesla's autopilot feature. Now, companies are on track to develop fully automated vehicles, which could which would not require any driver inputs. But through each stage of development, it is important to keep driver and passengers in loop, or in other words, develop systems based on user perceptions, preferences, and their feedback. So my presentation today will highlight how those user perceptions and preferences are incorporated into research and development. So let's start with the basic automation features in vehicles or level one. Now, when we talk about pediatric occupants, we are also referring to teenagers and hence teen drivers. The first few levels of autonomy are primarily going to focus on older children. But as we reach higher levels of autonomy, concerns around younger children start popping up. 
Now, there's enough literature that outlines that motor vehicle crashes le remain the leading cause of death for teens, and this is primarily due to inexperience and skill deficits. Now, automated driver assistance systems, or ADAS, as they're commonly known, have the potential to compensate for teen driver errors. Now, these features include um, automatic emergency braking, brake assist, lane keeping assist, blind spot monitoring, electronic stability control, among some of the others. However, in order to realize the potential of ADAS, both teens and parents must understand their benefits, be receptive to ADAS warnings, and should be willing to pay for the technology. So some of these characteristics would also apply to technologies such as occupant detection for pediatric vehicular heat stroke prevention as well. So based on the study of a national survey, or based on the results of a national survey we conducted on both parents and teen drivers, we found that majority of teens agree that ADAS can keep drivers safe. However, majority of the parents did not trust ADAS systems in preventing crashes or in making decisions in complex situations. When asked about the benefits of ADAS, parents showed a greater interest in ADAS intervention during unsafe driving. However, teen interest decreases during deliberate unsafe driving scenarios, such as texting while driving or breaking the speed limit. Now, this can be due to the belief that the scenario is under their control and their desire to maintain control. When asked about the effects of ADAS on driving behavior, only one in five people agreed that ADAS would lead to decreased situational awareness. And this has been supported by some other naturalistic studies as well. However, survey data suggests otherwise, and studies have shown that 29% of people engaged in other activities. Only one in five agree that teens should learn on ADAS vehicles. A reason for this is the concern that ADAS technologies might inhibit driving skill development. And then when we captured some open-ended responses where we asked them to describe a situation where ADAS could malfunction or not respond properly, Majority felt that the failure to respond properly would be due to the ADAS technology itself. So a couple of responses that we received were that there's a road near my house where a line of tar runs down the middle of the lane. My car always yells at me that I'm not in my lane even though I am. Someone else said that the lane keeping system does not understand potholes. Sometimes you need to quickly maneuver out of a lane to avoid an obstacle. So parents are more likely to be unsure, which may suggest a relative lack of understanding of that ADAS technology among parents compared to teens. And this has been observed in other studies as well. When we asked about the impact of ADAS, uh, majority suggested a positive impact. For example, the greatest positive addition ADAS may offer would be alleviating many fears of high-speed traffic. ADAS may be able to cope with keeping drivers safe, even when exceeding existing speed limits. This would open the avenue for creating new speed limit laws. Parents were more likely to suggest a negative or neutral impact, such as, I'm greatly concerned to the point at which I cannot stress this enough, that the vulnerability of having a vehicle hacked will increase exponentially. Any such vehicle could be virtually hijacked in terms of unwanted braking and or speed changes if a sinister agent in a nearby vehicle so desired. So the results highlight potential barriers to ADAS technology use among teens. Uh, studies like this can be used to inform educational campaigns to accelerate fleet turnover to vehicles with increased ADAS capabilities, an approach that has previously been used for seat belts and child restraint use. Now, there are several campaigns underway, but may require more targeted campaigns for teens and parents. Now, coming to level two and level three automation, where the vehicle can perform driving maneuvers, but still requires the driver to remain engaged in a driving task. Testing different autonomous vehicle driving scenarios and how the drivers react to failure cases is important to understand how we can develop these systems around the driver. So driving simulators are a great tool to study such scenarios. For example, for one study, we uh, studied drivers of different ages, including teens, adults, and senior adults in autonomous driving scenarios. A distraction event was triggered for some drivers and the autonomous vehicle failure event took place, which caused the vehicle to take an exit it wasn't supposed to take, which is blocked by a police vehicle. 
the participant is expected to gauge the failure themselves and perform a corrective action. So here's an example of that event where a driver is traveling on a straight highway, as you can see on the video on the top right. The vehicle is in autonomous mode, fails, takes an exit it's not supposed to take, which is blocked by a police car, but the driver breaks in time. Here's an example of another event where the driver, I'll just let you watch the video. So here the driver could not gauge the failure in time and collided with the police vehicle. Here we have an example of an event where a distraction event is triggered. So again, on the top right screen, we can see that the driver is asked to collect a specific amount of change. Same failure event occurs, but the driver breaked in time. And here's the same event where the distraction was issued. But instead of braking, the driver swerved back onto the highway, uh, corrected their vehicle, and then go back to collecting the change. So some participants did not react at all and went through the simulated police car. Most participants braked and steered the vehicle back onto the highway without stopping fully. And some participants reversed before merging back onto the highway. So all these different behaviors need to be incorporated while developing different types of technologies so they can address the behaviors of each of these different types of drivers. So in our study, 43% of drivers crashed, uh, which could have been avoided by more vigilant participants. Um, adult drivers were less likely to crash, and this was because the need to look down triggered caution for these experienced drivers, which also caused them to move closer to the brakes. Middle-aged women seem especially good at avoiding a crash by multitasking, which was engaged in a distraction task as compared to all female participants. Teens showed the best baseline reaction and recovery times, whereas seniors had a low reaction time. In case of seniors, years of driving experience led to better handling of the situation. When not distracted, adults and seniors took more time to regain control of the vehicle than teens. So this study suggests that adult drivers are better equipped to react to a potentially catastrophic failure of an autonomous technology. Now, as development into autonomous vehicles accelerates, it's important to consider these human factors at play when interacting with this technology. So coming to level four and level five, uh, now due to complete autonomy and minimum human intervention, automated vehicles could potentially relieve drivers from the driving task to engage in other activities, including working, reading, or conversing with other occupants inside the vehicle. Now with this intention in mind, several vehicle interior concepts have been proposed that allow for engaging in such activities. However, consumer preferences for these configurations needs to be assessed so we can determine the configurations we may need to design those safety systems for. So for this, we built a mock-up fixture corresponding to the interior of a minivan. Three popular seating configurations were tested. Uh, the first was when the front seats faced backwards, then the side seats, uh, side seats facing inwards, and then an X configuration where the seats faced inward towards the center like a lounge. Parents were asked to restrain their children in the age appropriate child seat in each of these configurations. And those ages of children ranged anywhere from three month old to uh, seven year old. Now, what we found was that although times taken for to install and remove the CRS was not significantly different across those configurations, parents were able to release their children fastest in the X configuration. Their overall experience did not differ significantly across conditions. However, most parents preferred that X configuration due to the ability to interact with other passengers, ability to see the road, uh, the large legroom for comfort. Um, but many passengers disliked having some passengers not facing forward. Parents liked facing their children, but said they would be comfortable only if they could see out the front windshield. Children liked facing their parents' faces, but also preferred facing forward. Now, this data can be used to study the safety implications of these configurations in potential crash impacts to design to guide design and safety improvements in vehicles and chassis in both seatbelt development and airbag development. So an example of this is where we used data from these configurations to test kinematics of booster-seated pediatric occupants in autonomous vehicle crash impact scenarios. 
In one study, we explored the effect of seat back recline angles in frontal crashes using a 10 year old child anthropometry representative crashed us dummy, uh, which was restrained in a low back booster and in a no CRS condition. So the images over here show the still frames at the point of maximum occupant excursion or how further forward the occupant moves in the crash. On the left, we have the nominal seat back angle of 25 degrees with the child in a low back booster. In the center, we have a moderate recline angle of 45 degrees with a child in a booster. And on the right, we have a no CRS condition in the 45 degree recline angle. Now to give some context, submarining is a dangerous phenomenon where the lap belt rides over the child's pelvis and loads the abdominal soft tissue, causing severe and potential fatal internal injuries. And you don't have to be a scientist to understand which of these images does not look comfortable at all. So we observed submarining in the no CRS cases, so the one on the right hand side, uh, but the boosters seemed to prevent submarining in the recline scenarios. However, with an increased recline angle, we did notice increase in lumbar axial forces, uh, though we don't know if those forces are injurious uh, right now. So belt positioning boosters could represent a countermeasure for submarining in child occupants riding in moderately reclined seating configurations in future autonomous vehicles involved in frontal impacts. However, the increased lumbar axial forces with increased recline angles and the use of the booster seat may need to be considered for future seat pan and booster designs. Here's another example uh, where we use data from these configurations to test crash impact scenarios in autonomous vehicles. Here, the occupant, uh, which is a six-year-old, is booster restrained in the front seat, which is now swiveled to face rearward. We studied two different recline angles, a standard 23 degree recline angle and a 48 degree recline angle. The vehicle then gets into a high speed frontal impact, which in fact is a high speed rear impact for the occupant itself. Now the internal spacing was based on a mid-size sedan. However, some modifications that were conducted were to test the vehicle with and without a head restraint. We observed that the child translates rearward into the vehicle seat and upwards. Now, in case of the low back booster, there is potential interaction with the vehicle windshield. Neck extension was observed when the low back booster was used without a head restraint, which was eliminated once we used the head restraint. In an OCRS condition, no extension was observed because the motion of the child was restricted by the vehicle seat back. For the 48 degree recline angle, the child rides up the vehicle seat back, and this motion was not observed in the 23 degree recline. Since we are using advanced human body models, uh, we can observe that greater stresses are observed in the child's upper torso. Uh, the three-point lap shoulder belt holds the restrained shoulder in place, which in this case is the right shoulder, if you see from the image on the bottom, um, causing the shoulder to translate upwards, causing an unsymmetrical ro torso rotation due to that impact. So this study suggests that newer or advanced restraints may be needed to protect the occupant in all types of seating configurations, including swiveled and reclined seats. Now, there is extensive work being conducted on adult occupants, but pediatric occupants present a unique challenge and need to be considered to ensure these systems protect the entire population of road users. Now, all these studies highlight the importance of incorporating user perceptions and preferences at each stage of automation to ensure correct usage and application of those technologies. Now, these studies can guide effective educational and awareness campaigns, user training, uh, and occupant, system sa occupant safety system designs. Now, it is also important to include the perceptions of all populations of road users, including children, teens, adults, families, uh, while we are developing these technologies. Now, studies like these are trying to inform those vehicle and child seat manufacturers, government agencies, and safety assessment programs on factors to consider while designing and testing automated systems and vehicles. So as next steps, we need to consider different aspects into autonomous vehicle safety development. Starting with education, we need to determine, organize, and disseminate appropriate information that prioritizes child safety. In advocacy, we need to envision and discuss ways to spread message of preventing child injuries in automated vehicles and develop programming, influence policies, and form partnerships. Now, we need to continuously monitor emerging technologies to assess their safety and identify priority areas for development of industry standards. 
Now, all these individual categories need to be ca tackled together to ensure we cover all bases while adopting advanced technologies that have the immense potential to reduce human error and accidents. So I'd like to mention that industry, government, and researchers have already begun trying to address these various issues of children in autom automated vehicles. Uh, Safe Kids in Automated Vehicle Alliance, or SCAVA, aims to highlight those issues and make sure children are accounted for when designing these automated systems. The various sub-areas that SCAVA is concentrating on are uh, advocacy, education, emerging issues, and research development and testing. As part of the effort to ensure autonomous vehicles are developed with child passengers in mind, we SCAVA members developed a design failure mode and effects analysis for different aspects of travel in an autonomous vehicle, um, including before travel, during travel, and after travel, and then during a crash. As an example, I have the during crash condition here listed with all potential failures that could occur in each subsystem, such as the child seat and vehicle seat interaction or the child seat and vehicle restraints or airbag interaction, et cetera. And the effect of that failure, in which in most cases is injury or death. Now, this could be used by manufacturers to ensure all potential failures in autonomous vehicles are accounted for. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge all the amazing researchers at the Center for Injury Research and Prevention, Thomas Sechrist, Helen Loeb, Patrice Tribule, and Valentina Gracci, who led the work that I presented in my talk today. And I'd like to thank the Center for Child Injury Prevention Studies, or CTIPS, and all the member industry advisory board over the years for funding all the research highlighted in this presentation. And that's all I have for you today. If you have any questions or need any more info on the studies we've conducted, please feel free to reach out to me via email included in these slides. Thank you. Thank you, Jalaj. I really appreciate you taking the time to share this presentation on this webinar today. Um, as a reminder for everyone in attendance, we're going to discuss questions at the end of the webinar. So please put your questions in the chat box. Um, and with that, we'll transition to our second speaker, Denise Donaldson. She's owner of Safe Ride News Publications. Denise is the um, Safe Ride News publishes educational materials for the child passenger safety field, including the Safe Ride News newsletter and the Latch Manual and the School Bus Safety Handbook. In 1996, she founded a program that provides checkup events and community classes through Seattle area hospitals, which she continues to run to this day. She has been a CPST instructor since 1998 and is a recent past member of the National Child Passenger Safety Board. Please join me in welcoming Denise. Thank you so much, Amy, and thanks, Jalaj. Um, I'm going to transition our discussion a little more to uh, direct it at what CPSTs specifically need to know on these topics, and we'll reiterate a lot of the things that Jalaj said, but in our context. So first off, just this attitude that we want to take to our, all our new technology is welcoming whatever opportunities those can bring us to better protect kids. That's going to be our aim, but we also have to remain watchful for potential risks. And um, it's not always assume, we cannot assume that consideration for how child passengers will ride in all of these vehicles is taken into account. So we do need to be watchful while we're also looking at the opportunities. And so earlier in Jalaja's presentation, he talked about the um, levels one and two that we have seen for a long time in vehicles. Um, these are kind of the forefront of what will eventually be our completely automated vehicles. We're already experiencing today a lot of that technology. And as he described, those kinds of things are available now. They are helping us with some of our uh, crash avoidance that's uh, helping already, as well as solving some of the problems that we have, like using technology to prevent heat stroke deaths, keep track of how children are, are buckled up and things like that. So we have a lot of opportunities to protect kids better using that technology, but you need to know what it is. And uh, he mentioned uh, NSC's My Car Does What? And there are actually a couple other um, there's the NHTSA Vehicle Shopper's Guide, as well as AAA has an Advanced Driver Assistance Systems site 
where you can learn more about these technologies. Because one of the problems, of course, is when you don't know what they are, you're not likely to use them. And most of them have a driver option to turn these things off. And if you don't know you should be using it, often you might turn it off. Um, we, we do have, just like we will eventually when we get into uh, automated vehicles, we're gonna have, we have a period going right now where there are some cars that have this level two technology and, and of course other cars that don't. And sometimes the same person might drive in each kind. So I can definitely relate to the, the anxiety that Jalaj mentioned that some parents might have if a teen learns how to drive using one kind of technology, they at more level two, and maybe they don't understand how to do how to actually react when they don't have that if they happen to be driving a different kind of car. So it's important to understand these things, know how to use them and and be in keeping in mind um, to keep them turned on, um, but be mindful of when you're driving in a vehicle that doesn't have that same level. Uh, on a more nuts and bolts level too, um, these things aren't like, um, you know, under the hood only mysterious things. They have to have some sort of a way to assess their environment in most cases. And those are gonna be uh, radar, LIDAR cameras, things like that. And we can see evidence of them on the cards we have today. You can see little um, outlines, sometimes they're little circles. You can barely make out on the grill of this car. There's a very big system that is assessing what's in front of the car there. Um, so, there are um, one thing for us is to consider uh, just on a very, very day to day basis, those things have to stay clean um, so that they actually work. If you see that there's a lot of debris or um, dirt that's gotten onto those kinds of sensors, then you're not going to have the same uh, benefit from them in, a, in a, any of your driving situations or a crash. And uh, <laughs> For that matter, um, if you are if they're damaged because they're on the exterior of the car, this happens to be my car, and uh, I had a had a little altercation with a deer, and of course it would be right there where my very expensive system is, and uh, all of that um, body damage was far less than the the cost of replacing all the, the sensors. So uh, we'll also be having those situations in the future where a car that should have this kind of equipment, perhaps it's damaged and it needs to be repaired. Can people afford those kind of repairs? Now, uh, the title of this presentation mentioned electric vehicles as well. And certainly we need to be watchful of any new technology that's coming into our space uh, and, and that used by children. And, and clearly we've seen electric vehicles coming for quite a long time. I just had an article in the Seattle, uh, the Seattle Times yesterday that mentioned that for the first 10 years, it took uh, to get to the 1 million electric, all electric vehicles sold in the US. And then over the last two years, or two, then it took two years to sell an, another million. And in the past year, we've now sold a million, just about a million within a year. In other words, we're kind of at a tipping point where there's a lot more of these being sold. We're going to see a lot more of them in the market. Uh, but obviously, uh, it, it's especially successful in states like California, where they have a decent uh, infrastructure, uh, charging stations. You know, if you live in areas where you don't have that infrastructure, you're seeing them far less, but they are coming and we will be seeing them. And so uh, these are pictures I actually took with Katrina Rose and I went to uh, a uh, all electric and hybrid vehicle uh, called uh, Electrify Expo is a traveling auto show. And it happened to be here a couple of weeks ago. So like we do at regular auto shows, we went and we took our little notes in the back seats and checked them all out for how they would work for kids. And there's a lot of interesting things. There's some things you can see here that are um, going to affect how we install car seats, but they aren't necessarily because they're electric vehicles. They're because they're newer vehicles. They're a little bit, a um, little uh, cutting edge. Um, the one thing we do see with these is you're going to have less likelihood of a big drivetrain hump down the middle. This is the floor of the back seat over here and on the bottom right. And in many of the electric vehicles, that floor is flat or is going to be have a very small hump compared to some of the ones we see more often in regular um, gas vehicles. Um, and so we're kind of watching that. Obviously, a more flat floor is more conducive for fitting 
a load leg of, of many of the car seats we see with a stability or load leg feature. Um, but we do uh, want to consider the fact that in those cars, there may be a battery under the floor. So at this point, I haven't heard any manuals say don't use a load leg in those situations if there's a battery under the floor. Uh, but I've also not heard anybody say, yeah, go ahead and do it. So it's just one of those things we'll be watching for. Otherwise, I would say most of the electric vehicles are only different in that they are among the newer types. And you might see some interesting uh, features just because of the newness, but uh, not necessarily um, uh, extremely different because they are uh, electric vehicles. Now, when it comes to automated vehicles, though, um, we've been hearing about those for quite a long time as well. I even um, I wrote an editorial in Safe Ride News in 2015 because at that point I'd been hearing for enough years a very uh, confident statements that we would have automated vehicles. People would not be driving cars anymore in a very short while. That was back in 2015. These headlines are from around 2019, um, still kind of saying we're we're about to get them. But uh, by, about, by 2018, we had formed uh, the predecessor of SCAVA, the working group, um, the, uh, the consortium for autonomous vehicles or automated vehicles. And um, while the headlines were still kind of blasting this, it's coming, it's coming, uh, it did, we could see that it's coming a little slower than we thought. But then this happened <laughs> in 2018. There was actually a, one of the tested vehicles that got approval to test from NHTSA without explaining that it would be testing taking children on a school bus to school. And you can see this isn't your average school bus but it was an autonomous vehicle with it and an attendant. And as soon as NHTSA found out that they were taking children on the vehicle to school um, in this testing, they made them stop doing this testing. But again, um, because this is brand new technology and it was in test mode, it is an interesting observation that they would think it's okay to do some very early testing using children as those people who are the guinea pigs for this. And you can see no seat belts, very unusual uh, seating configuration. So while we know that we don't already have autonomous vehicles out there all over the place, they are popping up in various spots. And so uh, earlier, just a month or so ago, a big report from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine came out that was all just about realistic timing estimates. So I thought, ah, perfect. You know, here we have this presentation coming up, and I can give people the exact timing for everything. Uh, and it turns out it was quite a long report, and it is an excellent report. But it, it, instead of giving me exact timing it mainly tells us a lot of different um, potential outcomes that could occur and the contingencies that would be required for various outcomes. And so again, it's not saying when we're gonna see this, but it does set out one useful piece of information, I think, which is it describes these use cases being freight, transit, fleet, and personal. When it comes to vehicles, a lot of the stuff we're hearing about automated vehicles won't really necessarily be the vehicles we would be expecting to put children on. So um, we might see sooner, um, much sooner, we might see freight or something where we are not so concerned about children. Then we might get examples of, of transit kind of vehicles and, you know, kids might be on those, but it's going to be a lot later on before we actually have a lot of self-driving, even ride shares on the road and and then even further down the road to have actual personal vehicles on a widespread basis. So that's kind of the setting we're we're sitting in today. So whereas back in 2015 they were promising it would be out by 2018, we're today a little more uh, realistic. So we have some time to keep our eyes open, but our objective needs to be that kids cannot be an afterthought. We have had other instances where we've had technology where, you know, the airbag situation is, is a prime example of where technology was, was brought out and it wasn't until after it was in use and children had died that they recognized there was a danger to children. I would argue that cars themselves would be one of those things where, you know, they really didn't take the, the particular considerations of a child's differences into mind when they developed the seatbelts of the car or the way cars work. So, 
you know, what are we supposed to do about it? Well, obviously we like to always be as proactive as we can be. Uh, in some cases though, this is out of our control, but we're gonna have to be reactive as well. So with the rest of my time, I wanna talk a little bit about how we can be, how we're gonna react when we see those things and what we can do to maybe be proactive as well. So I mentioned earlier the, the Automated Vehicle Consortium that pre, pre, that's the predecessor of today's SCAVA group that I was in. We were tasked with trying to alert pretty much any audience, whether that's the public, whether it's the, the designers of automated vehicles, whether it's the regulators or lawmakers, we wanna alert them to potential considerations for children and what risk areas there might be. And that was challenging because we didn't necessarily know what would be coming down the line. So we broke it out into areas of what happens in a crash, what happens in a non-crash situation, you know, new risks for in and around cars, things like that, and also considerations for supervision and responsibility for kids, because these are all under the umbrella of child passenger safety. And then we, you know, I don't expect you to read all this, but just giving you an idea, then we had to kind of start brainstorming what would be early automation? How would this affect mid transition and when there's full, all the vehicles on the road are automated? And so you saw there was a table that Jalaj showed earlier as another kind of way to try and think through uh, the various potentials and to avoid risk somehow. So taking all of those kinds of things uh, was what kind of directed us toward uh, the website that Jalaj mentioned at safekids.org forward slash AVs. So this is your place to go um, to find all sorts of information about children in automated automated vehicles, safekids.org forward slash AVs. Uh, what I'm showing here under educate the safety community, there are a bunch of different um, resources, including a webinar you can, uh, or a PowerPoint you can present yourself as a webinar to your groups. But one of the other things is this infographic. And I would just like to point this one out because uh, I was pretty pleased with how this is set up because again, we're trying to reach a lot of different audiences. And so we set this up thinking of the various concerns we have, like how are they going to be uh, using car seats in those vehicles? What happens if a crash occurs? Who will be supervising the child? And we put each of those considerations with this little icon that says ask, because we want each of these, whether you're a lawmaker or a designer or a parent we, or a CPST, we want you to ask these questions. When you see these things, ask, what about kids? What about kids in each of these situations? So as a CPSTs and especially considering child restraints, how will children use restraints in AV? So we're kind of going to think about, I mean, ask ourselves these questions. And when we do that, we're going to always go back to our roots, to our basics. It's going to be the same in an AV Things are going to be different, but we want to go back to these basics of selection, direction, location, adjustment, securement, and installation. You know, it's going to be always, we're going to think about the different stages of child development and the way the kids should ride to be safest in those stages. And the, you know, remembering with direction, the reasons that kids need to be protected uh, from those frontal forces because of the development of their body and the proportions of their body are going to be true whether they're in uh, an AV or any other vehicle. Um, but keep in mind, of course, some of the unmentioned assumptions in this is that our direction, uh, we have a front and a back of the cars that we drive today and we drive forward typically. Our speed is at a forward direction. Um, so and all of our regulations for how car seats are made are based on this frontal impact testing at the, at the present time. So um, those considerations have to be uh, taken into account. Now, as far as location secure, securement and installation, uh, we're going to still want to follow the owner's manuals for both the vehicle and the child restraint system. We're going to want to make sure that we've selected the right uh, location and we are installing according to those instructions because that's our good better best paradigm right we're at the very least we're going to make sure we follow the car manufacturer and the car seat manufacturer's instructions so the question will be will those things keep up with the changes that we're going to see in the vehicles themselves one hopes so but that's what we're going to want to be watching out for so 
um, going back to our ask kind of question, we're going to ask about some of these steps I just talked about with in terms of AVs. So Jalaj showed us, it was pretty cool to see all those different vehicle configurations that they came up with. And this is just a, a drawing from one of those studies that his he and his colleagues did. Um, so none of our instructions today would allow us to put uh, any boosters or car seats in those side facing or angled seats. So when they studied whether the parent could get the car seat in, we almost want to say, but hold on, do we even want them to? So, you know, we need to be thinking about that because these are the designs. This It's an easy thing to search online to see some of these vehicle interiors. I just grabbed a couple of them for these pictures, but there's all sorts of different exciting vehicle interiors. And who could blame them, right? When you take away a driver's seat, you know, that has to have a steering wheel facing forward, taking up a certain amount of space. You put the other seats around that. When that's gone, boy, that's like remodeling. You can come up with all sorts of exciting and interesting interiors for vehicles. And you can count on the fact that there are people out there right now pretty excited about all this, but have they thought about children in these cases? So it's great to know that that research has begun. You know, we're glad that there are people out there that are looking into that. And uh, again, here's some of that consideration. They're considering this whole campfire concept. They're considering what's called a carriage concept. And it's a good thing too, right? Because one of the first kind of shuttles that we're seeing and very similar to that school bus we saw is a carriage concept where they're facing one another. Um, we're definitely going to see those, but some of these shuttles are bi-directional. They would get to their destination and then they would stop and they'd go back. So where I live, I take a ferry every, you know, very frequently and my car goes on and it goes to its destination. Then it turns around and comes back. So it's, uh, we don't see that so much in cars, uh, but in the future, we very well might see a bi-directional car. And so can a car child be placed rear facing in a vehicle that doesn't have a designated front and rear? How do we adapt to that for kids? And then there's there might be some other characteristics of the vehicle that um, are going to affect. Now, um, Jalaj went into a lot of explanation about seat, seat back recline and that there, there might be a lot more recline in some of these situations. You can see that as well as the feeling that well, wouldn't it be cool if we could do a lot more of our work in the car, in the car, if there's no driver needed, we can have computers, we can have tables. And so there's definitely some consideration there of both projectiles and things that might get in the way of uh, crash dynamics of children. Uh, and so you can actually start to see some of that even coming into play. This is, um, what you're seeing here is from that Electrify Expo that Katrina and I went to. And we've seen for a while those screens on the backs of seats and even some that have popped down from the roof. But I've never seen before one like this. It's already offered in a BMW that's uh, out there today where this is a screen that is completely, it can fold up into the ceiling, but it's a full length of the back seat. And so I'm, you know, I, I know this was, probably, you know, is for an executive probably sitting in the back, might even be thinking about kids and their entertainment, but are they considering the child's safety? Um, and, you know, we've seen other things like this too, where the, this is um, some Chrysler town and country, and there have been some Dodge vans as well with these swivel and go seating. So we, we have had these where the, the center seats roll around, but notice in both of these promotional pictures, the vehicle door is open because the instructions for these are always gonna say, never place a child a booster seat or an infant carrier in the swivel and go seat while it's rearward in the rearward position. So um, do people pay attention to that even today? I'm not sure, but uh, the instructions do say that. What will the instructions say on autonomous vehicles in the future? Um, likewise, we have seats that really recline a lot uh, and even some that have leg rests that come up, but again, their instructions say, don't do these things while you're driving, uh, only do them when you're stopped. And one of the reasons we presume that's true is that the human body is going to react negatively, even for an adult, but certainly for children when they are uh, in a recline position. I like the the stuff that Jalaz was showing because it, it, it showed the difference between if there is a good solid head restraint behind the person or not. 
uh, but it does give you a lot of, um, uh, re makes you realize how many different considerations and moving parts there are that will all play a role in how it's gonna work for children later on. The other thing they're kind of thinking about right now already is um, how to be able to protect people if they're not buckled up or buckled up with um, an airbag. And so these are some um, prototype or drawings of potential airbags. They're not in um, cars yet, um, but this one that's on the left, uh, well, actually the one on the left is the Mercedes-Benz model rear airbag. So that is in a car today, a very expensive Mercedes. Um, but there are other versions um, out there as well. So uh, in the center, I haven't seen this one quite yet. Um, I think that the Hyundai one might be in some cars, if not now, but or soon. And um, anytime we see airbags, uh, we know that today they are testing out a position uh, occupants and we, but those tests are largely voluntary. So we, we definitely wanna keep on top of how they would affect children. So um, then lastly, there, there's probably some differences in how cars will crash today. We're very much concerned, of course, with frontal crashes, but when an AV is, is in a crash with a non-AV, for instance, will those more likely be occurring when they're T-bone type of crashes, uh, oblique crashes? That remains to be seen in the future. But if the type of crash dynamic changes that, that's most common or most deadly, perhaps we're gonna to have to change the way we design our protection for all occupants and adults. And then there's also going to be potentially some cars, some vehicles, maybe shuttles, maybe ride shares, who knows what down the road, that there just isn't any way for a car seat or a child to ride in safely at all. Um, right now, we know that you know there's all sorts of vehicles that kids can't be safe in, like a semi-truck or a tractor or something like that. Um, but mostly we don't use those. But there may be down the road some vehicles that families do want to use with their kids, but there really isn't a safe way to put a child in it. Already we use trains and big buses that don't have seat belts for kids, but those are large vehicles that have a much different crash pulse in, a, in an actual collision. If we take a small vehicle, like a rideshare vehicle, or um, you know, take an Uber or Lyft or something that's automated, that's a regular car. A child would need to be protected in it just like they would in any other vehicle. So those are kind of things that we might end up having to be reactive about. There are ways we can be proactive. You're all being proactive today by attending this webinar. So thank you for being here. Um, and we can also be telling people today what they need to know about the, the um the ADAS in their current vehicles, but someday we're also going to be needing to train them about automated vehicles. So we'll watch for new locations for labels or instructions or novel installation steps. And I think Jalaj even alluded to it. We may need to come up with different kinds of, of car seats, but we'll wanna make sure and hope that we are finding that the instructions are keeping up with the vehicles that those, that children might be riding in. So whether that's the instructions for the car seats we use today and how they could be used in those vehicles or new ones, that remains to be seen, but we need to be aware that these will be um, out there and be prepared for them. Um, now, as far as the regulatory environment for this goes, I um, just want techs to understand that there has been, there have been four different reports from NHTSA that outlines their intentions and um, outlook for autonomous vehicles. Cause of course NHTSA keeps the regulations for cars, which it kind of aces out some of the things they want to do with AVs. So um, in 2016, they made a report and then they followed up in 2017, um, reiterating that they are they want to encourage new entrants and ideas that would forward the whole autonomous. Now, mind you, none of this mentions children, okay? But it's good to know where, what their mindset is. Uh, then in 2018, there was a 3.0 uh presentation uh, report put out um, noting, of course, that they want to prioritize safety, 
but they want to be technology neutral and they want to modernize the regulations to be prepared, which they actually did do. There was and there was another report in 2020. There was actually in March of 2022 a final rule that updated our 200 level or crash crash worthiness level standards. So 213 is one of those 200 levels that didn't get changed, but many other 200 level. Um, standards did get a change to make it possible that there be no driver and it also um, anticipates the potential for stowable steering systems um, and you know because the, it was a final rule of course there was a notice of proposed rulemaking and so it was brought to light well if they're not going to have uh, the driver's seat there then we need to take front passenger uh, requirements from the front left uh, and put them over in what would formerly be the driver's seat so that we would still have seat belts, we'd still have um, the, the airbag um, mitigation, um, advanced airbag warning systems, and other features like um, switchable belts or lockability so that we could put car seats there potentially. But another thing that was interesting to note um, is NHTSA laying out the, the differences between NHTSA's responsibilities and state responsibilities, because states are gonna be more on, along the lines of the licensing in those vehicles, the laws, and, and that would be where I would say supervision would be involved there as well, supervision of children in those vehicles. So um, CPSTs are educators and they're also advocates. If you want to learn more about how to be an advocate so you can interact with your um, legislators in your own state or even uh, commenting to NHTSA, um, another great way to find that information is at that safekids.org forward slash AVs uh, site. There's a whole toolkit for advocates there. And I'll just finish by noting that as well as the CPS board and the NSC that put on this webinar, and of course, Safe Kids has been on the forefront of thinking of children in this environment. We have some other advocate allies that we should kind of be keeping uh, touch with and um, bringing into the thinking about children, one of them being the Governor's Highway Safety Association, which um, has been looking at this topic. Of course, that's the kind of be the state side of things. Um, of course, Consumer Reports has recently developed its rear seat safety score. So, um, and those ratings I, I just learned today um, are going to be put in front of the paywall so that we'll be able to go get those without being subscribers. Thank you so much to Consumer Reports. Um, and because they, you know, these aren't just about autonomous vehicles, but they are going to, of course, think about children in those newer vehicles as they come along. So that'll be a place for us to look as well as the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, always a great resource for us. Um, they had announced they were going to do a um, rating of the safeguards of partial automation, meaning uh, rating how well those would remind people like it shows in that picture, keep your hands on the wheel, something's coming um, for that level three automation that's still supposed to be down the road. Um, I have not found that they have started doing that, but that is something that they have on the horizon. And that is my last slide. I see Amy is on there to ask some questions. Um, thank you, Denise. Um, thank you to you, Angela. You have both shared such interesting information, gives us so much to think about. So thank you. Um, I want to turn it over to Mandy to see what, que I know there's questions um, from the audience. So Mandy, yeah, thanks. You know, start. you bet there are a lot of questions. It's been a, an amazing session. Thank you all. Um, we're going to start off with, are you aware of any legislative efforts to put child passenger consideration in developing or selling automated vehicles? Denise, do you want to go first? Um, so I'm just, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to the point of developing or selling. I don't know of any with the developing or selling, but um, at NHTSA.gov, um, there's a um, AV test site where states can voluntarily put information and share it with the car manufacturers. Um, and if you go to that site, which you can get to through that safekids.org forward slash AVs, um, if you go there, you can start to, uh, you can look through what legislation there is. There has been just a little bit, I know North Carolina did some um, 
preemptive forward-looking legislation about child um, supervision in some of its laws. But as far as the selling of them, I don't know for sure, but you could check that at NHTSA.gov. Yeah, I agree. I was going to say the same thing, Denise, that uh, again, Safe Kids slash AVs is a great resource for all this information. And um, the only legislation that I'm aware of is the same North Carolina legislation where they uh, don't uh, want people to be traveling. Do they, they don't want children less than 12 years old to be traveling alone. They want someone to supervise them while they're traveling inside AVs. But besides that, I don't I don't think there is anything Another thing that the AV Consortium put together was sample legislation. Uh, so there is sample legislation that you could, you know, mm -hmm. take and, and suggest that someone in your own state look at um, and, and, a, and a policy um, paper as well to kind of give a background to all of this. As a side note, one of the additional questions was, um, or suggestions was a full webinar on how to be a legislative ad advocate. Okay, our next question. I can see Denise nodding. Yep. <laughs> um, how is NHTSA trying to stay ahead of testing regulations for car seats, given the potential for various seating configurations? So, so I'm sorry. Say that one more time. How is NHTSA? How is NHTSA trying to stay ahead of testing regulations for car seats, given the potential for various seating configurations? Well, I mean, I would just say that um, when they um, updated the regulations a, a bit ago, they were trying to eliminate, it was mostly to eliminate language that presumed a driver's seat so that it, it wasn't so much saying exactly what was going to be uh, available as an AV, it was just trying to eliminate things that would put up a barrier for new technology. So please remember FMVSS 213 and FMVSS 225 have not been altered. They still exist in their current state. So it's comforting to know that uh, we still have that requirement out there. It does not make me 100% confident that we won't wind up with a situation like um, you saw the the different configurations of the seating where the owner's manual does not um, jibe with what we have in our car seat manuals to make sure that they go together, but we do still have to meet 213. Yeah, I, um, I can talk a little bit about NHTSA's involvement. Um, so NHTSA supports a lot of research projects similar to what we did, and NHTSA is actually one of the industry advisory board members for a lot of our projects. Um, so we are undertaking projects on children and recline seating scenarios and alternative seating configurations and trying to uh, provide NHTSA with that data as well. Um, NHTSA is also funding other research on autonomous vehicles. They recently wrapped up a project with the University of Michigan Transportation Research Institute or UMTRI, uh, where they tested different types of child seats in different autonomous vehicle configurations and impacts. I think the outcome of that research was that um, they, the, the newer types of impacts don't necessarily um, provide an additional risk that isn't already seen out there, but it will probably change the proportion of crashes that you see out there. So instead of frontal crashes occupying like the major proportion of crashes, it might be like oblique crashes or side crashes uh, just based on those CT configurations. So NHTSA's being uh, proactive about this. It's funding all the research to get all the data. I know uh, regulations and all, it takes a lot of time, but they, they've they started doing their work in this space. Yeah. And I guess what I would observe about that too, is that then if we do, so it's great to test and make sure it's safe, but we as CPSTs and the public using car seats need to also have that, those instructional changes. If it's okay to use, it needs to be stated that it is okay. By the time we are confronted with those configurations in a car <laughs> yeah, so, that absolutely. so we don't have uh, that disconnect there. Thank you. Before our time ends, we have one more question, but we have several more if you guys want to stick around. But for our last one, um, Angela asked or said, thanks for this content. I was hoping to learn more about how electric vehicles and other and things families or CPST should know. Sounds like the only notable difference at the moment is that EVs are less likely to have a drivetrain hump and therefore impact the use of a load leg. 
Are there other things families are thinking about when it comes to EVs that we can help demystify as it relates to CPS? Well, and I'd open it, put it in the chat. If you've thought of something else that is specifically about it's being electric that um, makes those cars different, um, I would love to brainstorm with people about that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and that goes same for me. I mean, um, if, if you have ideas on electrical vehicles on how they might be different from standard vehicles, uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe that's a research project as well. But um yeah, I think the only cause of concern and the difference that I see in normal vehicles and electrical vehicles is the absence of that hump and then the question of load legs and whether it's going to punch a hole through the battery. Um, we've, we've done some projects related to that. We haven't found something significant that it might punch a hole through the floor, but uh, it's definitely a cause for concern that could be alleviated if, you know, electrical vehicle manufacturers state that, that it's okay to use a load leg inside those vehicles. I remembered the one other thing too is that uh, electric vehicles are more likely to would have a frunk, right? The front trunk. Mm -hmm. I saw one at the auto show for a, a, a Ford pickup that's humongous. Anyway, the reason that could be slightly related is just for projectiles. It just, you know, if you have that much more space where you can put that stroller and things away where they're not going to be a projectile in the, in the area of the um, child. But you see, I'm, yeah. I'm grasping at straws here. I, I have few, <laughs> think yeah. put anything else, anything else in the chat. <laughs> yeah, um, but at this, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was just about to say these vehicles are extremely extensively tested using computer simulations, actual crash tests for both pediatric occupants and adults to ensure that you know things like this don't don't happen. So the vehicles that you see on the road, they're all tested according to regulations. If there's a vehicle that doesn't clear those, it probably won't sell out there in the first place. And Jalaj, I would love it if you guys would test those screens. I mean, I've always worried about the screens and, and the backs of seats. And now if they're yeah. going to put big ones down off the ceiling, I really would love to know more about that. Uh, for sure. It was amazing how large that one in the photo you shared, Denise. Yeah. Um, so much to think about. Thank you again. Before we end today, I do have a few closing announcements to share. You may have noticed a new look with the National Child Passenger Safety Board. The National Child Passenger Safety Board has updated the logo, and we hope you love the new brighter look as much as the board does. Uh, trying to advance my slides here. Um, if you would like to contribute to child passenger safety on the national level, the membership drive for the National Child Passenger Safety Board is now open. The board is seeking applications for positions of community engagement representative, injury prevention healthcare representative, and law enforcement public safety representative. These positions serve from May 2024 through May 2027, and applications are due Saturday or by Saturday, September 30th. You can visit cpsboard.org forward slash um, board. Let's see, let's try that again. cpsboard.org forward slash board dash membership for more information or scan the QR code on your screen. And then we hope that you are enjoying the NCPSB webinar series. The board is having fun delivering these webinars and we hope that you'll join us in October for the CEU webinar, Latch Learning with Peachy, the 2023 Latch Manual. Visit cpsboard.org forward slash webinars to register or scan this QR code on your screen. The webinar recording for today will be posted at carseateducation.org within one to two business days. For the child passenger safety technicians in attendance, this presentation does qualify for one CEU. Proof of attendance will be emailed 24 hours after the webinar. You must enter the webinar information into your profile at cert.safekids.org to receive the CEU for recertification. Thank you so much for joining us today. Have a safe day and thank you for all you do to help keep ch child passengers and their families safe. And with that, Tammy, I'm gonna ask you to stop the recording and uh, Denise and Jalaj, I don't know if you're willing to answer any more questions if time allows and Mandy, if there are questions, additional questions. There are a few.